Good morning, everyone. So here we are, Seattle and the theme of community. It's been my privilege over the last several decades to do work here in Seattle for a variety of employers. Uh, my first experience was working on an initiative in the 1990s with FEMA called Project Impact, Building a Disaster Resistant Community. It was a public partnership, public private partnership initiative here in Seattle, working with the business community, uh, local schools, uh, first responders, urban planners. Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, it was consensus driven and it resulted in, in really doing some things for resiliency that made this community uh, safer during the Nisqually earthquake that occurred in 2001. And then in the early 2000s, I was a project manager working for King County on a Homeland Security strategic plan where we had people who normally don't always get along with each other having to come to consensus. We had emergency responders, we had uh, uh, public health workers, we had urban planners, parks and recreation officials, public works, uh, law enforcement, a lot of people in the room that don't share necessarily the same perspective or the same philosophy, yet had a uniting cause which was to keep the public safe. We aren't really that dissimilar as an organization. We have a lot of different perspectives. We don't always share the same approach or believe in the same um, methodology, but we do share a common vision and a common mission. We truly are a community. Our community is made up of a variety of, of, of segments. We have, of course, our member board members, our member board executives and their staff and our attorneys our public members, our IPAL schools now have joined the community, committee volunteers, architects, licensure candidates, educators, collateral organizations, certificate holders, state legislators, governors, and agency directors, the media, and most importantly, the public. This mosaic, from the staff perspective, creates the community that we serve, and we work to inform the diverse elements of this community as to what makes us strong and drives us to go further. From the NCARB staff perspective, we have a diverse community to serve and we measure it through our NCAR by the numbers annual publication. I hope you've had the opportunity to pick up a copy of NCAR by the numbers at our table and I want to go through a few key metrics from this document this morning. In 2015, and all of these uh, numbers are as of the end of the calendar year 2015, even though we're halfway into the new uh, 2016 year. In 2015, we had over 41,000 licensure candidates actively working toward licensure. This is a record high for the council. Within this number, we had over 30,000 that were reporting experience, and we had over 18,000 that were testing for the exam. Both of these communities, those recording experience and taking the exam, set records for the council. Now, before you do the math, there's an overlap group. We had nearly 8,000 that were doing both, reporting experience and testing. This is a testament to the vote you all took a number of years ago to adopt model law that would allow early access to the exam before completing experience, and I believe 50 of our 54 jurisdictions now make this uh, opportunity available. As you will see in our full NCAR by the numbers report, the majority of new licensees that are now starting the exam are doing so before they complete the experience. So the tipping point occurred in 2013. More people than not are now starting the exam before they finish experience. So you can see over time how your model law votes start to take, take root nationally. When we look at program completions, we have more good news. In 2015, we had over 4,800 complete their experience records taking on an average of 4.3 years. This is six months sooner than one year ago. This was aided largely by the streamline of the experience program that went into effect just in July of this year. So we're really at the beginning 
of seeing this number shrink a little bit because we were only six months into the new streamline when we measured this data. We also saw a similarly strong performance with the ARE with over 4,400 complete, uh, 4, completions. This community of examination candidates took an average of 2.1 years. That's also another six month reduction over a one year period. This, uh, we believe, is largely due to the fact in October of 2014, we reduced the retake policy, so you now only have to wait 60 days rather than six months before you retake the exam. So that's over 4,000 talented professionals that are soon to be joining the ranks of the profession. I'm also pleased to report that our licensure candidate community continues to become more diverse. For example, in 2015, over 40% of people starting out on the path to licensure were women. So, all of these changes, how have they affected the timeline to licensure? Well, the next slide I'm going to show you is just a snapshot of the class of 2015. These are the folks that have been in the queue for a while. Most of them have not been able to take advantage of the new streamlined programs. So the class of 2015 has now, on the average, taken 13.3 years to get a license. This is from the time they've enrolled in school until that state board hands them their license. This, to the good, is a 3% drop, so we have a downward trend line. But uh, we are, and this is the seventh year in a row of the timeline dropping. However, we are, again, I believe, at a tipping point here. We've just introduced these streamlined programs in the last year or so. The people that are just getting into the pipeline won't come out for a couple more years, but I think this trend line is going to continue to drop somewhat dramatically over the next few years. So the path to licensure is healthy. Here's a positive result. We have another uptick in the total number of licensed architects in the US. This is based on the survey of our member boards. It's up another 2%. We're at 110,000, over 110,000 licensed architects pra uh, practicing across our 54 jurisdictions. This increase in the pipeline has an impact on our customer base at NCARB. Of the customer base, we have over 62,000 that are in a uh, non-licensed record holder status. Over 62,000 are non-licensed record holders. Another 4,500 are non-certified but licensed. And then over 40,000, almost 41,000 by the end of 2015, and that number has gone up since December, are now uh, certificate holders. We have over 108,000 NCARB record holders. This is a new high for the council. We expect that in the coming years, as we implement all of our streamlined programs and their rigorous options, that these numbers will also continue to grow. So with a healthy pipeline, with an increased customer base, we are now facing some new challenges as an organization and as a community. First, as you heard in the workshop yesterday, there are challenges to regulation. Whether it be the North Carolina Dental Board decision, the ideology that uh, argues at the state legislative level that regulation is unnecessary or overreaching, there are new challenges to regulation. And we as an organization collectively, as a community, need to be vigilant, we need to be agile, we need to be strong advocates, and we need to be in partnership with you and other organizations to address this issue head on. There are ongoing pressures at the state budgetary level. A number of you in this room have seen your staffs merged. You're taking on multiple disciplinary boards or different board assignments, or you're basically trying to do more with less. That means we need to step up as an organization and provide some services that perhaps in the old days you were providing and figure out in a customized way, on a case-by-case -case basis, how can we be your lifeline? How can we be your extra hands? And then lastly, to the council itself, there's a challenge regarding revenue management. If we're going to have people going through the pipeline faster, if we're going to deliver less divisions of the exam, 
That's a net loss of revenue to the council. How are we going to examine our revenue streams, as you heard from Dave Hoffman's report yesterday, to make sure that we're as robust as we can be, that we're seeking out new opportunities, that we're making sure that the financial stability of the council continues so that we can meet all of these challenges. So we are going to take several actions to move forward in meeting these challenges. A revitalized certificate program. That's our major source of revenue. We are growing in this regard. We've now added free continuing education for HSW credit for all certificate holders. This is just the beginning of a multi-year process on identifying new benefits. Many of you who've served on committees participated in an exercise this past year on identifying benefits. This is a hallmark of Christine's year as president where we're going to be focusing on adding new benefits to the certificate. This should partly address the revenue challenge that we have at the council. Facilitating advocacy, as I said a moment ago, we are in a, a new place as an organization where we can have new conversations about what's going on at the state legislative level. Not in a way that violate, violates your role as member boards, not in a way that is competing with other organizations, but there are partnership opportunities that we've already been pursuing in several states on looking at advocacy for positive change to adopt some of the actions that you all have approved as a membership. We also are seeking stronger coalitions. Our conversations with the collateral community are becoming more fruitful and more direct. We are now talking with the uh, code community, the code of, uh, officials community. We have an ongoing relationship with the landscape architects and engineers that we can grow. And there are other opportunities. Uh, again, uh, in, the, in the workshop yesterday, hearing about the coalition that we are part of through our membership in FARB in working with other organizations like NCARB to advocate at the national level in front of the U.S. Congress. Why are we doing all of this? Well, we want to lead the conversation. We have things to say with our data sets, with our new uh, uh, interest in, in uh, pushing for reasonable regulation, and we have a voice that people want to hear and that people are listening to. But most importantly, the real why it's because licensure still matters. It's because regal, reasonable regulation is necessary to protect the public, because we are still relevant as an organization, and you are still relevant as licensing boards. And we are going to assert that role and continue to pursue it with as much vigor as we can. But to get it done the right way, we have to have a plan. We have to think strategically. We've had an excellent strategic plan in place here now for a number of years. But starting with this meeting, some of you are participating in focus groups. We're going to be doing some more surveying. We want to make sure that our strategic plan also remains refreshed. Just as we are refreshing our programs and, and clearing up our vision for the future, we want to make sure our strategic plan is still relevant. So we look forward to a conversation with all of you about where do you see NCARB going in the next 10 years? Where should we be? What have we forgotten? What do we need to pick up? How do we need to course correct, and what should we keep on doing? So that's the beginning of a longer conversation. I'd like to close by introducing our wonderful staff, our support team, as I call it, that are here to serve you. And I hope a lot of you have had a chance to go out to the uh, uh, community center and talk to the staff there. Um, I'd like to start with our customer relations department. Um, Roxanne Alston, who many of you know, is now the director of that department. And this year we brought some of her staff here, the people that talk to you on the phone, respond to your emails, to physically meet you face to face at the registration booth. And with her is Demetrius Norman and Demetra Lewis, her two assistant directors. If Roxanne, Demetrius, Demetra, and the entire customer relations staff could stand and receive our thanks. Many of you know Doug Morgan, who now is the director of our administration directorate, and Doug's portfolio includes finance. Uh, with him is uh, Rob Dickinson, our controller, and Vanessa Williamson, who's our director of meeting planning and administration, um, and that includes the team with uh, Nikki and Kim, who've done so much logistically to help us with this hotel space. 
Uh, Doug and Vanessa and uh, Rob, if you're in the room, please stand up and be recognized. Tomorrow you're going to be hearing from Guillermo Ortiz de Zarate, our Director of Information Systems. With him today is Shaheen Shakiri, his Assistant Director. And they have been working tirelessly to create new customized software programs for all of these initiatives, crunch the numbers with NCARB, uh, NCARB by the numbers, and basically create an infrastructure for us that keeps current with your customer needs. So Guillermo and Shaheen, if you would stand and, and your team and be recognized. Our Director of Examinations, Jared Zern, and his Assistant Directors, Ryan Meisner and Joan Peros, uh, helped run the workshops yesterday on Area 5.0. Jared's taking on some extra duties and um, staff liaisoning our new Resilience and Sustainability Work Group in the coming year, and it was the lead of the Project Manager in working with AIS on our new relationship uh, with Freedom by Design. Uh, they've been uh, just a constant source of information, education, clarification, we appreciate their hard work as we get toward this November 1st launch. Jared, Joan, Ryan, and the examinations team, if you would please be recognized. <laughs> Many of you know Kathy Hilligas and the council relations folks. We've been focused on providing information to you regarding tracking legislation. Uh, looking at uh, alignment of your model law with, N uh, with your law with NCARB model law and doing outreach to our member boards. Uh, Kathy and her assistant director Derek Hayes and their team, would you stand to be recognized please? <laughs> Harry Falconer heads a department that we now call Experience and Education. His team has been front and center for several annual meetings now between BEA, Experience Streamline, uh, the Integrated Path, uh, all of these cutting edge things that we're doing, they have been front and center. They've taken a few hits along the way, they have the bruises to show, but it's a revitalized and exciting uh, department, an exciting place to work. With him today is uh, Martin Smith, his assistant directors, Martin Smith and Michelle Dixon, and his entire team, would you all stand to be recognized? Our newest department director is Andy McIntyre, who's the director of marketing and communications, and our longtime staffer, Amanda Pika, who's now his assistant director. Up in the booth is Drew Ransom, who designed this gorgeous graphic and is sweating through the teleprompter work with all of the, the folks up at the podium. And a lot of other folks from his department are here pushing out press releases. We've already been picked up by Architect Magazine regarding yesterday's announcements, and there's more to come. Uh, Andy and Amanda and your team, would you please stand to be recognized? <laughs> Stephen Nutt is our senior architect and advisor to the CEO. He's been maintaining our international portfolio, staffing the ethics uh, task force, overseeing our project planning for our centennial, uh, doing a little work with the staff architects on creating a community there in the office uh, and has been a loaned executive part-time to the FARB to, to introduce the concept of advocacy and a uh, passion for regulation that is unsurpassed. Stephen Nutt, where are you? And last but not least, my right arm and, and both feet and everything else, uh, Mary D'Souza, our Chief Operating Officer and the Director of this conference, who is our champion of strategic planning, insists on agility, transparency, cross-departmental collaboration, and uh, uh, the safety net for the organization, Mary D'Souza. Are you back up there or where are you? Somewhere. Back there. Yeah. So, we really are a community, and the thing about a community is because we know each other and we are passionate about what we believe in, we get revved up, we get worked up. Sometimes, guilty as charged, 
we can get a little too excited. Perhaps we overstep. Uh, perhaps we uh, need to take more time to listen. And it occurs to me with the tragedy that occurred in Orlando this last week that life really is, is short. We really have to count on each other. We really have to work on listening to each other and respecting each other. We have done so much because we are this mosaic, a group that is passionate about protecting the public, passionate about working together toward a common goal. I encourage you to keep doing that in the hours and days ahead. I want to thank our board of directors for being such a great support to our staff, such a great partner, such a great part of our community. And I want to thank you. This is my five-year anniversary at this annual meeting. It's really gone by quickly. I appreciate all of your coaching, your positive feedback, your constructive criticism, and the work yet to, be, to, yet to come. Thank you very much.